So, um, we're in Isaiah 3 still. Our title comes from Isaiah 2. If you weren't here, this has been several weeks back. We kind of took a break. But Isaiah 2, there were a couple of verses that reiterated this thought. And that was that the Lord alone shall be exalted. And Isaiah 2 lists the things that are bringing the judgment upon Judah. These were the things that God saw there and He was going to judge the people because of that. We saw that they were a people that were very religious, but they were also very worldly. Right, so they had a prof an outward profession. You know, one chapter one is uh, they're, they're, where God is talking about how He hated their worship. The Solomon assembly he couldn't stand it. Why? Because chapter two explains even further that they had a they had God on their lips, but they were idolaters in their hearts. Right, and uh, they were very rich people. They were a people full of pride. Chapter two tells us, God said one thing: you you can mark it down. You may glorify yourself, but the Lord alone shall be glorified. And so those were the sins that were listed out for us in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And now we hit chapter 3 and he says, and the things that we're reading here, and I, I hoped we stressed this last week, the things that we're reading here are not reasons that judgment is coming upon them. The things that we're reading here are evidences that the judgment's already come. They're already being judged. They're already under the judgment of God. This is judgment being pronounced by God upon a people that has rejected Him. And I think that's an important distinction when we get to this chapter here. We need to realize the day and age in which we live because as we went through here, what were we seeing? It sounds just like modern day America. The exact same things we see prevalent among us today. Uh, it, recognizing that it is the judgment of God, it doesn't mean that we fail to expose sin. It doesn't mean that we back down from confessing the truth and begin to water down the gospel. It doesn't mean you know, any of these things as far as denying God. It means that we stay faithful in such a day. But it, it's important that we realize what the issue here. You know, People get all excited about let's legislate this and, and make this law and do this and that to correct things, but that's never going to fix the problem because we're under the judgment of God and you know what's going to fix that problem the only hope we have in such a day we, we know 2nd Chronicles 6 7 14 but I want to read it to you again if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land that's the solution God gave them God hasn't changed. Humble ourselves, pray, seek His face, turn from our wicked ways. Our hope is in the Lord. And so we find a land here as we begin chapter number 3 who, where the judgment has already begun upon them because God says this day is coming. The day of the Lord, it uses that phrase also in chapter 2, where the Lord alone shall be exalted. I told you last week I wanted to get to a particular verse. I'm hoping we'll get there today. This is what really uh, is it, 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 my, my desire in this chapter here. There's a verse that the Lord just highlights and magnifies in my mind, and I want to share it with you. But let's continue on to understand what kind of day it was. Um, we saw that the Lord was moving, removing everything that they relied upon for hope, everything that they put their trust in outside of God. We see that uh, the stay of staff, bread, water, uh, the stay and the staff, the stay of bread, the stay of water in verse number 1. Every type of person, whether, whether they were actually uh, people that were you know, worthy of listening to or not, all the ones that they trusted in in verses 2 and 3, God is taking that away. Children, people with an attitude, with a child-like uh, nature. Not a good childlike way like we're supposed to approach God, but children that threw temper tantrums. That's what we said the word babes mean in the end of verse number 4. That's who's going to be ruling over them. Those that couldn't control uh, uh, their, 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 uh, their temper. Those that could not control, uh, that exer didn't exercise self-control. And verse 5, the people shall be oppressed, everyone by one another, uh, everyone by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. And, and we saw that in Psalm, I think it was maybe, maybe it was 128, that when the, when, when the wicked are exalted, it said the wicked walk on every side. And that's what we have today. And so now we come to verse number 6. It says, when a man 
It'll be a day, that day of judgment, when a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. And that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. Such a day, the Lord said, is also marked by a people who refuse to labor for themselves. They refuse to do the hard things. You know, we just went several three weeks uh, through a series of messages on quit you like men. And what did we say that was about? That was about doing those harder things because for God's glory, right? Because God's glory is at stake in those things. Choosing the more difficult path for the glory of God. This day is marked by a people that would rather have someone else work. They would rather have someone else lead, someone else handle these difficulties rather than take responsibility for themselves. It made me think of Saul. You know, when, when, uh, when the time had come, the people wanted a king. And what did God say? Because Samuel was upset about that. And God said, hey, Samuel, you're not the one that really has reason to be upset because it's not you that they've rejected. They've rejected me. And so they, they want a king from among the people. I'll give them what they wanted. But when they go to find, to look for Saul and actually anoint him as king, do you remember what it says? They couldn't locate him. Does anybody know what he was doing? He was hiding, right? He was hiding among the stuff, the Scripture says. It's like, where can I go anywhere other than handle this responsibility? These people are looking for that. Someone to take care of this problem. Someone other than me. I want someone else to do the hard stuff. I want someone else to work. Not me. I want someone to take care of it. Saul was hiding among the stuff. And you look around today and you, you're like, where are all those people? You know, there was a time in this nation that it was marked by those that knew they had to work hard and they were willing to work hard. Because that was what was whatever it took, right, to make ends meet. That attitude, that spirit's not among us anymore. We have a society today that thinks they're entitled and they should just get the handouts and I shouldn't have to work for anything. That's what you found here. That's what we find among us today. A society that would rather pass the buck. There's rarely a sense of responsibility. The attitude seems to be that if someone else will take care of it, I'll gladly let them so I don't have to. So you find that in verse number 6. And so, you, you be our ruler and let this ruin, let this mess be under your hand. Notice the basis for picking this one to rule. The basis for picking this individual is just simply, he's got more stuff. You're, you're rich compared to us, right? You've got more stuff, so you take care of this problem and make sure that we're okay. It's not that he's honorable. It's not that he's wise. It's not that he's humble or godly. None of the qualities that we ought to be looking for in leaders, right? None of those are there. It's just simply, hey, you have clothing. You're doing better than the rest of us, so let this ruin be under your hand because the goal here is my comfort. And if, I, if, and if by putting you over us, it's going to be, lead to my comfort, then I want you to have the job. What is it that gets people in office these days? You're going to cut my taxes. You're, you're, going to, you're going to give me something that makes things more comfortable for me. Right? Not where's integrity? Where's godliness? Where's faithfulness? Where's humility? We're living in this day, folks. We'll let anyone lead as long as we think we can have more. But at this point, things are in a mess, right? And you see that it, when they use that phrase there, he said, let this ruin be under thy hand. And so what do we find out in verse number 7? This guy's prosperity is just an illusion. May, maybe he's got enough for himself. But the response back from him is, when they try to put the burden on him, is, I don't want the responsibility either. 
I don't want to suffer for your sake. I don't want to suffer to serve you. I hardly have enough for myself. Are you crazy? And, th and so he refuses. They don't want to take the responsibility. They try to pass the buck. The one that they think is better suited refuses to serve and do the hard things because at this point they're in such a mess that it's simply a ruin that he would be ruling over. Let this ruin be under your hand. Things are going to decay very quickly in a society when there are not those among them that are willing to lay down their lives for the sake of others. Where do we see that example? Who is the greatest example of that? No greater love, right, has any man than this but that he lays down his life for his friends. What is this man refusing to do? I refuse to do without and serve you and be an healer. The margin reads, a binder up among you where I have to do without and have nothing for your sakes. You know, you know what he's refusing to be? He's refusing to be Christ-like. Because what does it say according to 2 Corinthians 8 9 that Jesus Christ did? We know the text, but let's, let's read it with this thought in mind. Read it with this thought in mind. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse number 9. What does the grace of God teach us? What, is we, what do we see as we look at Jesus Christ? What was it that the disciples were arguing about and Jesus said, wait a minute, that's the way the Gentiles think. I don't want my disciples thinking that way. They were arguing about who among them would be the greatest. And Jesus said, the men of this world, they're all about exercising authority over one another, but if you will be great, the greatest among you is the one that will be servant of who? All. Right? He didn't exclude anybody, right? And you know who is the greatest among us? You know who was servant of all? Jesus Christ. Listen to this verse, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse number 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How gracious was He that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor. He didn't have to do that. He chose to be poor for your sakes that ye through His poverty might be rich. Where are those kind of leaders? Why is this man refusing to take the job? Because at this point, it's reached such a state that it's like this is just a mess and a headache and I don't want to suffer to try to fix it. I don't want to suffer to serve your souls. But that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. It was through, though He was rich, though He had everything and didn't lack anything, there's nothing that we could add to His glory. He said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't ask you, what could you give me, right? And yet, for your sakes, He became poor that we might be made rich through His poverty. People that want to be in charge, that, that want to be in that place of leadership because of some sort of glory associated with it, they don't understand this pattern of Jesus Christ. They don't understand what it means to truly lead. Because the best of leaders are the leaders that are in the pattern of Christ. And Christ's pattern was, I want to serve you. Not I want to be served, I want to serve you. This man refuses. He has no heart of service to die for himself for the good of those that he serves. My point is that it was wrong on both sides. <laughs> both, both sides of it, right? The people that wanted to be ruled over and then the ones that they sought to rule, there was no heart of service there in them. To be a leader after the pattern of Jesus Christ means taking care of stuff that you don't want to have to deal with. It means doing the things that you feel inadequate to do and that you'd rather not be on the hook for, but you do it anyway. Crying out to God, asking for wisdom and strength to handle it the right way. Where are those kind of leaders among us? 
This is not an opportunity that's full of glory and recognition. People will sign up for that, right? But as verse 6 said, let this ruin be under your hand. It's a mess. And nobody wants to do the hard thing to take responsibility for it. This man had no leader's heart to take on the hard task of caring for others that aren't going to appreciate it. And I promise you, if you serve and you try to serve right in a place of leadership, you're going to experience that. You're going to be serving people that don't appreciate what you're doing. That's the way it is to serve in the pattern of Christ. That's the role that Christ took on. I still remember our pastor telling us the one that loves is the one that gets what? Y'all remember? Nailed to a cross. That's it. There he is dying on a cross and what's he doing? Praying for who? The ones that put him there, right? Serving their souls and getting on a cross. Wow! We're leaders like that. So this is what you find among a people that aren't heading towards judgment, among a people that are already under judgment. And so listen to verse number 8. Verse number 8 says, For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen. Now, for the first time, we're going to hear why in this chapter. We're going to hear why they're under the judgment of God. Now we're given the because, the, 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 the cause for this happening, right? These things are that we've read so far, they're the evidences that they're under God's judgment. But what led to it? Verse number 8, For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is falling, fallen because their tongues and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of His glory. Our brother has faithfully told us over and over and over again, where did man drop the ball? It was with God's glory. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What is our title? The Lord alone shall be exalted. Who is worthy of glory? The Lord alone is worthy of glory. He's the only one that intrinsically, just in and of Himself, is worthy of worship and praise. If there's anything good in us, it's just God in us, right? But God is good. That's what Jesus told the rich young ruler who was coming there to confess how good He was. Jesus said, uh, there's none good but God. But one. And that is God. So, judgment has come upon them because their tongue and their doings, their way of life is against the glory of God. To provoke the eyes of His glory, they are putting themselves in a place of opposition to the glory of God. When the Lord alone shall be exalted. They're putting themselves, that's the same sin that we see with Satan. I will be like the Most High. That's what they're doing. That's what they had done. That's why this judgment was upon them. There aren't any to lead like we just saw. God took them all away at the beginning of the chapter. Those are all gone. The good and, and the bad, they're all taken away and there's no one that will even step up and try to handle this mess and it's because they put themselves against, they lived in a way that was contrary to God's glory. They exalted themselves instead of glorifying God. Everything about them was vile. So with this strong of a charge against them, what you would hope to find is you would hope to find a people that says, we get it. Right? We messed up. We, we, we knew what we were doing was wrong and we did it anyway and now here we are in the middle of that consequences. God forgive us. But what do you find according to verse number 9? The show of their countenance doth witness against them and they declare their sin as Sodom. What does that mean? What do they not do? They don't hide it. There is no shame for sin. They, they wear it boldly. Right? Look at me. Look at what I'm. Look at how wonderful this is to live contrary to the glory of God. They declare it plainly. 
There's no shamefacedness. It's not done in a, in, a, in, a, in a dark place anymore, right? It's not done in a corner. I mean, we have sins among us. It, coming out of the closet, right? That's what, they, that's what they call it. Why? Because the things that used to be secretive and considered shameful, now we wear it openly. And he says, that's exactly what it was in the day of Sodom when I destroyed this place. What were they doing? They were living their sin boldly before the eyes of God and they had no shame for it. They declare it. They do not hide it. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Look at Jeremiah 1 and verse number 7 regarding Sodom, a statement that Jeremiah the prophet makes here. Same thing. Wait a minute. It's not 1 7. Let me see. I told you, Brother Ed, I had it in my phone. Let's see if my phone's right. Jeremiah, where did I get that? Oh, I wrote down, okay, I wrote down a different passage. Jeremiah 23 14. 23 14. Yeah, I was very close, right? Jeremiah 23, 14. Listen to this. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem. And who's he talking to here? He's talking to the kingdom of Judah. Isaiah is speaking to Jerusalem and Judah. I've seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. He said they're doing all these things and there's zero repentance. There's no confession that what they've done is wrong. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Said Sodom had reached the same state. They sinned openly. If you look at Ezekiel 16, uh, 49, we won't go there for time's sake, but it says that they were prideful, they had fullness of bread, they were very rich, and they were idle. They were a lazy bunch. They had zero care for anybody outside of themselves. All the things that we're finding here in Isaiah chapter number 3. They were given over to fornication. They sought after strange flesh. Jude 1.7 says, same things that we're finding among us today. The same charges God brings against them here. They had hearts that were full of iniquity and there was no shame in any of it. They sinned openly before the Lord. This is what has brought the judgment upon them. There's no repentance. There could have been forgiveness had they sought the Lord's forgiveness, but there is no shame for what they do. There is no seeking. There's no admittance that they have lived contrary to the glory of God. They don't hide their sin. They wear it boldly like, a, like a, some kind of badge of courage. Woe unto their soul, God says, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. So, back in Isaiah chapter 3. Here's the verse I wanted to get us to. Alright? Because listen, when you're living in such a day like this, this is discouraging, man. It's hard to live in such a day, right? When, when we see that the, that the vilest of men are exalted, and so that means the wicked walk on every side. And what kind of people are selling out arenas? What kind of people are we putting in power? What kind of people are they, are they interviewing you know, on the evening news and are they writing the articles about in magazines? You see the vilest of men exalted. And it means that we're in a day where the wicked walk on every side. And Jesus said in the day of abounding iniquity, what's the danger? The love of many will grow cold. It's discouraging to look at all that. But God gives such a tremendous word of hope here. And He says to Isaiah, I want you to make sure that you say this. And I want to encourage your hearts with the same exact thought today. I don't want us to be... We ought to be affected by the sin. The sin ought to grieve us. But I don't want us to be defeated. I want us to embrace the truth that in Jesus Christ we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. 
Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. And, and so as you, as you live in a society that is further and further away from God, guess what? That, the heat's turned up on that. And you see that resistance from every avenue. But Jesus said, even though in this world you shall have tribulation, I want you to still be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. And so when God is saying all these things, He's listing out all the ways that judgment is coming upon, has come, already come upon this society, the same patterns that we see in our world today. He says, I want you to make sure that you say something to the righteous. In verse number 10, Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him. Listen, dear saint, I want you to understand it's going to be okay. It's going to be well with you. It's going to be easy to get discouraged in such a day. So tell my people specifically, it will be well with them. The rest of the verse says, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. In some ways, I just kind of feel like it's an extension of what we were looking at the last few weeks. Quit you like men, right? Continue to be faithful and be strong and strive after the glory of God. And God says, listen, everybody else may be ignoring that. Everybody else may hate it and despise it. But you know what? I'm paying attention. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain and it's going to be well with you. Isn't that good? Thank you, Lord, for such a word of encouragement. Amen. You're reading through all these things and you're like, this is today. God, have mercy. This is today. We're here. We're in the middle of this. And God says, I don't want you to lose heart. Saint of God, it will be well with you. We can sing it, right? We can sing it even in such a day. It is well with my soul. My sin. Oh, this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, right? He's dealt with every bit of it. And so even if you can't go away rejoicing that you're casting out devils, right? And you can't go away rejoicing that there were multitudes and Lord, we healed them. Jesus said you never should have been rejoicing in that anyway. You know what you should have been rejoicing in? That your names were written in heaven. That's the basis of our rejoicing and regardless of what's going on around us, that doesn't change. It is well with our soul. So the Lord sent me over here today to say that to the righteous. Now He's got a word for the wicked too, but we're out of time to deal with that. But thank God, righteous, it's going to be well with your soul. God's able to take care of you, even in such a day. Amen? May we be the light of the world that He's called us today to be even in such a day. May we still be witnesses of His glory even if we're surrounded by opposition to that glory. And praise and honor the One who alone is worthy to be exalted.